And as we go, sorry. Uh, is this part of the test, the upcoming test? This, this could be in the test, yes. So the test, as you saw at the beginning, is on Thursday next week. And so there will be one lecture for me at the beginning of next week on Tuesday. And the test will be on Thursday, and it will cover everything from my section of the course and everything from Trisha's section of the course. So we're going to weight the test so that you've done a lot more with Trish. You've done, I think, something like six weeks as opposed to three weeks. So there will be more on her material. And I will probably, yeah, I think I will not put in material from the Tuesday immediately before the test. OK, so everything from this week is testable. Um, the lecture on Tuesday will be examinable, obviously, but I won't put questions about that specific lecture into the test, so you have a bit more time to look over things. Okay, so as we go through this lecture and the next one, uh, what I would like you to do is to think about uh, a number of different things. So the types of things that I would like you to get out of these lectures and that I'm likely, more likely to test you on, uh, number one, what factors should you consider when assessing whether a landslide might take place or why a landslide might have taken place? Okay, so basically what are the risk factors? Uh, number two, what are the different types of landslide and how are the different ways those different types of landslides might affect risk, might affect uh, people in the built environment? Okay. Um, so those are the two things that I'd like you to try and draw together. So number one was what are the risk factors for landslides? And number two is to have some awareness of the different types of landslides, the different types of mass movement, and how their different characteristics affect the risk that they pose to the building world. And so for this section, so in the last section, Last two lectures, I said that there was a textbook called Structural Geology uh, by Fossen. That was the recommended reading. Uh, you don't need to go, it contains a lot more detail than you needed, but that is some way you can look if there was something that you didn't understand. In this section, I'm not going to set a textbook, but I would like to direct you towards the AGU landslide block. So it's the AGU is the American Geophysical Union. And on their website, they have a blog, which is called the Landslide Blog. And basically what that does is it is somewhere where researchers gather up all of the information for all the landslides as they happen. So if you look on there, you'll see information about large landslides which have happened around the world over the last few weeks. And the person that, that manages it, so Dave Petley, is a very good scientist and he adds like a very good commentary and explains what the videos that he's showing and what the, the features that he can see and things like satellite imagery and, and field studies mean in terms of the cause of the landslides. And if you have a look at those, you'll see the same things that I talk about in this lecture come up again and again, okay? So, yeah. And actually, a lot of the slides, a lot of the information from this lecture comes from that source, comes from that block. And every year when I do this lecture, I have a look and see what's on there and what's happened recently and try to find some recent examples to talk about. And there's always lots of things which illustrate the points that I like to make very nicely. Okay, so I thought I would start out just by showing you what a landslide can look for. So don't worry about the fact that all of the captions are in uh, Spanish, I guess. So this is a video which was taken in Chile. It's showing basically a group of tourists who are crossing a small stream uh, on a mountain. So this is in a volcanic area, so you have lots of fine ash and then with larger rocks in it as well. And the tour guide is in the middle helping people go through. And you can see, like, you can notice that the, the water looks very muddy, right? It looks like it's got a lot of sediment in it, which is maybe a warning sign. And at some point, he's going to look behind him. 
you probably shouldn't be crossing rivers. So he's noticed that something's wrong, and he's trying to get people out of the way. And so if we keep watching. <laughs> so that's a debris flow. So one thing which I think a lot of people think about in terms of landslides is that they're maybe relatively slow. But when you have particular conditions, particular types of sediment, particular, uh, well, the presence of fluid is also important as well. Basically, you have landslides which move as quickly as a flowing river. So you get these very fast-moving, turbulent, these very fast-moving, turbulent flows. You'll notice, as you see at the beginning, there was the first part which came through was full of these really, really large blocks, and it came as a front. So it came from not that much to a very large number of huge blocks almost immediately. So it's very typical of these kind of flows, and we'll talk later in the lecture a bit about why that happens and how it happens. Um, but I just wanted to give you some idea for one type of landslide and what they look like. Okay, so why might a landslide happen? So we've said before that you, if you're somewhere where you have incohesive rocks, so you have basically blocks which aren't in a cliff like you see here and here, like you see in Table Mountain, those blocks will tend to lie at a particular angle of repose, so a particular slope which is stable, and that slope is controlled by the coefficient of friction. So the people that did the practical on Monday will remember that we talked a bit about this then. Um, and depending on exactly what the uh, angle of, what the coefficient of friction for the material that you're looking at, you typically see an angle of repose of about 30 degrees to 40 degrees, maybe going up to 45 for some particular kind of angular large plaques, kind of boulders. Now, if you get a slope at that particular angle, just by dropping material down, it'll stabilize at that particular slope. Why then do you get landslides? Well, one of the main reasons that you get landslides is if we take our Coulomb failure criterion that we talked about previously, you can see that we have the term there, PF, which if you remember was a poor fluid pressure. And if you increase that poor fluid pressure, it reduces the normal stress. And that will then reduce the critical shear stress that C needed for failure. So if you increase the poor fluid pressure, you reduce the critical shear stress, and so effectively, the angle which is stable, the angle of repose, is going to reduce. So one of the... What do you mean by cohesionless material? Cohesionless material. OK, so basically, if you have a set of sand, a set of grains, okay? each one of those grains individually is not bound to the others around it. So there's no, to separate them, you don't need to put any uh, strength, any stress in to break them apart from each other. They're just sitting on top of each other at random. Okay? So something, that's what you would call something which is cohesionless, so you don't need to put any stress in to break it apart. If you have something like the steep slopes in front of Table Mountain, Okay, so that's solid rock, and it's connected to each other. It's not just a pile of unconnected pieces. It's something which is an inherent cohesive strength. Right? You would need to use some stress to break it apart. Okay, so that's why you can have very steep slopes. Obviously, there are places where you see these steep mountains, which are cohesive rock, so rock which has been deposited. In the case of Table Mountain, the grains of quartz have been heated up and the very high temperatures and pressures, and they've merged with each other. They've actually recrystallized, and that gives it its cohesion and lets you have those very steep slopes. Whereas if you just have soil, let's say, or a pile of sand, that, would be, uh, that wouldn't have cohesion. It would be non-cohesive. Okay. So that is one of the ways that you can cause landslides. And you'll see in quite a lot of the examples that we go through in this lecture, it's very common that the landslide happens after there has been heavy rainfall or some other cause for the poor fluid pressure being raised. So that's very commonly the trigger 
that lets a previously stable slope become unstable. And so this is just saying that again. So there is some relationship with grain size. So typically, the finer grain in the material has a slightly smaller slope, a slightly smaller angle of repose. So 35 degrees for fine sand, going up to 45 degrees for angular pebbles. But this is basically just related to the frictional forces between the individual particles. And as we said before, the uh, fluid water plays a large role in this. I don't want to stress this too much, but just to point out that if you have sand which is wet, so you have a small amount of water in the sand, it will tend to cling closely to the individual grains, and you actually have a surface tension which allows that sand to be relatively cohesive. So that's how, if you have wet sand, you can build a second next to the But as soon as the sand becomes water saturated, so as soon as the pores become completely filled with water, then you lose that surface tension and it will fluidize much more easily. So in general, if you have water saturated material, so the pores are filled with water, it is much easier to make it go unstable, and that's related to the pore flow pressure. And we'll talk more about that as we go on. So I don't want to use worry too much about that for a second, but just to let you know that the uh, saturated, the saturation, so the pores being filled with water, is a really important criteria for failure. Okay. So to give you some idea of a bunch of the different a bunch of the different uh, things which matter in landsliding. I would like to give you an example, which is quite a civil engineering example. And it's one of the classic things which is taught in pretty much every landsliding course because it is, was, I think, I'm not sure if it still is. At the time, I think it was the most destructive landslide um, ever. And it was caused by the creation of the Vaillant Dam in Italy. And so this is a picture of the dam. It was built in the 1960s. And it's a really good example of, I would say, hubris. So arrogance on the part of the people who are working on it. So this map is showing you where the dam is. So you have, it's in the north of Italy, so where you're going into the Alps, there's lots of high topography. They built the dam and filled this large reservoir behind it. The brown area here is showing the area which actually failed in the landslide that we're going to talk about uh, in 1963. The blue area here shows the area which was inundated with water from the reservoir when the landslide filled the dam, basically forcing all of the water up, out, and down into the valley. And the green dots are uh, centers of population, so where there were people living when the accident happened. So you can see that it's a really big area which was covered. So you have around the river more than a kilometer, a kilometer and a half or so that was affected by the water from the slide. So this was somewhere where people did consider whether or not there was a risk of landsliding um, in the area. So this is the geological cross-section. So I think you haven't actually drawn cross-sections yourselves, but you have had, uh, you've talked to Trish about geological maps, and I would imagine she would talk to you about dipping layers when she was doing that, right? So in this particular case, you have the strata, the different layers of rock were dipping in towards the dam from the west. So dipping east towards the reservoir, towards the valley. And you can see as well that we have some very steep slopes here. And that's actually caused by the river eroding down into the mountains, OK? So you get a deep gorge formed by the erosion, by the water carrying material away downstream. And one of the things which is very important when you're considering the geological hazard of landslides is this 
dip of the strata. Okay, so in this particular case, the strata were dipping in towards the dam. So I think you can probably imagine that that's a danger sign, right? So the strata are dipping in. The layers between the strata, particularly if you have thin layers of relatively weak rock, are going to be planes of weakness along which failure can occur. So if you were to, let's say, if you have an area which has strata dipping like this, and you build, so let's say you've actually made a road cutting. These are planes of weakness, and it'll be relatively easy for this to fail and slip into here. If, on the other hand, you were to build your road cutting on the other side, the planes of weakness are such that they're not orientated favorably for this material to slide in this direction, right? So basically, this is relatively dangerous, and this is relatively safe. Because here, the layers of weakness are dipping towards the place you're excavating material. Here, they're dipping away from it. Now, when they looked at the Bayon region, they noted this, but they also saw that the dip was reducing quite a lot. So it becomes basically horizontal as you get towards the reservoir. And they actually thought that this would probably limit the chances of there being a large landslide. So while this slope, if it was just like this, that would be pretty clearly unstable. The fact that you have this chair-like structure, you see what I mean, this shallowing of the dip, they thought would mean that this layer here, because it's almost horizontal, wouldn't fail. Uh, so that was one of the assumptions that they made. And they also thought that the rock here, so this layer here, this gray layer, which has this kind of brick pattern, that is limestone. And limestone is actually quite a cohesive rock, quite a, quite a cohesive rock, quite a strong rock. Because it doesn't generally have lots of planes of weakness, and it usually has very little pore space because, uh, I mean, it's not like where you have grains of sand with little gaps in between. Limestone tends to be fairly solid uh, calcium carbonate. So in 1960, they began to fill the reservoir. And when they had 170 meters worth of water, so when the water depth was 170 meters, they found a joint opening at the surface, so there's a photograph here, which was about two kilometers long, and it was moving at about three and a half centimeters a day, okay? So three and a half centimeters a day, not particularly fast, right? So this was something, often this is how a major landslide will start, okay? It doesn't necessarily start from zero, like you have with earthquakes. You often do get some form of early warning when you have landsliding. So you start off with gradual movement, and then catastrophic failure happens later. And in November 1970, this did, in fact, fail catastrophically. And about 700,000 meters cubed of material slid into the lake in about 10 minutes. Okay. Now, this is not the landslide which caused the disaster. This is three years earlier in 1970. And you can see, I hope, from this photo, that you have a very smooth surface left behind. The landscape, the landslide scar is this very smooth plane. And that's because that was a plane of weakness within the rock. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about exactly why there were planes of weakness in the rock earlier. But when this happened, they dropped the lake leg level, because they were obviously worried by the fact that 700,000 meters cubed of material had just slipped into their reservoir. And as they dropped the lake level, the movement slowed down to about a millimeter per day. So it slowed a very large amount. Now, probably the sensible thing to do at this point would be to say that we have a very steep slope, which is clearly unstable, because it's been quite a large landslide we should probably stop using this dam and this reservoir. Um, I would imagine that the logic went that they'd already built the dam at this point. So they'd invested a huge amount of money in the project, and they decided to keep going. So the landslide, the first landslide actually blocked the 
place where the water would have been able to go through the dam to create hydroelectricity. And so they needed to construct the tunnel, basically bypassing the blocked, the blocked outlets to allow the water through to drive the turbines. But when they'd done that, they started to fill the reservoir again. And they basically decided that as they filled the reservoir, they could control any landslide that happened by dropping the lake level as necessary. And this initially seemed to work reasonably well. So there was, they monitored the stability of the slope very carefully. And you can see that there was an increase in movement uh, earlier. So I think it was in 1962 or the beginning of 1963, up to around a centimeter and a half a day. And at that point, they dropped the lake level again, and it slowed. And so they were thought, OK, basically, we can control this. We can monitor this carefully, increase the lake level as necessary. We can drop it again, and we can prevent anything catastrophic from happening. And they probably should say, at this point, something about why changing the lake level might actually affect the stability, why we might be causing these increases in movement of the slope as we raise the lake level. And it's basically all about the pull fluid pressure again. So as you fill your reservoir with water, you're also raising the water table, so the depth to which you have water within fractures and cracks within the rocks. Okay, so as the lake level rose, also you were filling up all of the fractures and cracks and planes of weakness within the strata nearby with water as well. Okay? And you can calculate what the pore fluid pressure will be by calculating the hydrostatic stress, and that is just, if this is the depth, it'll just be the density of water times G times the depth below the surface of the water. So basically, the weight of the column of the water above the point that you're interested in. So as you fill the rate, as you fill the reservoir, at a particular point within the water table adjacent, you're going to be increasing the pore fluid pressure. Now, as you can see, after they stopped the second slide, they then started to increase the lake level again. And in October 1963, there was a catastrophic failure. So the rock slid about half a kilometer at about 30 meters per second. It filled the gorge up to 400 meters. So that's 400 meters worth of water that was then displaced. The water actually went up the opposite bank by more than 260 meters, because there was a village on the opposite bank, which was swept away, even though it was 260 meters above the lake level, just by the water being splashed up the opposite side. It then overtopped the dam and went over well, 30 million cubic meters of water over top and down, and then went down more than 500 meters to the village below. You can see from this picture, this is a landslide here, this is a dam. You can see the landslide has basically totally filled half of the reservoir, half of the lake. So, this is all being controlled by this increase in pore fluid pressure, which is reducing the normal stress and bringing the slope closer to failure. And when they looked in detail at the rocks, if you remember when they did their initial study, they said that the rocks were made of limestone, they're relatively cohesive, and therefore they should be relatively safe. When they looked more carefully after the disaster, they found thin, impermeable clay layers. So this brown material here, which is very fine grain, this is a thin, impermeable clay layer, and that was within the fractured limestone. And it was along one of these very thin clay layers, so they're only on a centimeter 
scale level, but it was along one of these planes of weakness that the failure actually occurred. Now, if you remember when we were talking about Biley's law and coefficients of friction, we said that there were some types of rock which don't fall on that nice line which gives you a coefficient of friction of 0.6, and it was clay minerals which were the ones which had the lower coefficient of friction. So basically, even this very fine scale layering, one weak layer, which is a lower coefficient of friction, that was part of why this failure occurred. This was part of why it was easy to fail along this particular layer. Clay also is very impermeable, so it is hard for water to flow through it, and that also allows you to have and sustain higher pore fluid pressures. And in terms of why the failure continued, even though you had that very shallow dip as you approach the reservoir itself, one theory for that is that frictional heating may have caused the failure to accelerate. So basically what I mean by that is once you start sliding, once you start moving at an appreciable rate, you're doing work against friction, you're going to be producing heat, that heat is then going to be heating up the water, which is in these impermeable play layers, and as you heat it up, it'll actually expand. So you're going to increase the pore fluid pressure rapidly at the point of failure as well, and that is one reason why the failure might have continued to become catastrophic. So, in terms of... And so... I don't think it probably, well, okay, so probably the world's worst da dam disaster. There have certainly recently been larger uh, disasters which involve landslides, but it killed over 2,600 people, and it affected people living many miles away from the reservoir. And even though you might have thought, given that they were monitoring the slope, I could see the slope beginning to move, you might have thought they would have perhaps evacuated the villages and towns immediately downstream but that is not, that did not happen, okay? So, I guess one of the points of this, as well as to discuss the different, as well as to discuss the different uh, factors which cause this failure to occur, is also to emphasize how difficult it is to predict exactly how these systems are gonna behave, and so we need to act with additional caution. So this is a more modern photo of the area, you can still see the scar from the landslide. You can see that it's covering a huge area. It's basically half the mountainside has slipped down. So the limestone, while in itself it's relatively cohesive, this particular limestone had quite a lot of open fractures and sinkholes. So that's where the calcium carbonate has dissolved through rain, uh, which would weaken it. You have the weak clay layers which were inclined towards a reservoir, so that's something that should have been identified by taking more careful cores through the strata so you can actually see the layers of weakness within it. You have the very steep topography, so that very steep topography was basically created by the erosional action of the river as it eroded down into the landslide, into the landscape, sorry. And also, in the period immediately before the failure occurred, there was also increased rainfall. So you had the filling of the dam raising the pore fluid pressure, but you also had exceptionally heavy rains, which probably also contributed to it as well. Right. And some combination of these factors are behind many, many events. Was that a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, the increased rainfall, was it caused by that landslide or was it just a so, seasonal thing? So it was a seasonal thing. So the, yeah, there was unusually heavy rainfall immediately before the landslide. So it's, I mainly put that there partly because heavy rainfall is often a trigger, but also because in the literature there's some debate as to whether it could possibly have been the rainfall rather than the filling the dam that was the primary trigger. I mean, these kind of things are difficult to say for sure. It was almost certainly a contributing factor. Were there any other questions? Yes. Is the, the dam still there? The dam is still there. It didn't actually collapse, so the water was displaced over the dam, but the dam remained standing. I mean, I do not think that... 
I'm not sure if it's currently in operation, just because half of the valley before the dam, half of the reservoir was filled with landslide material. So I would imagine it will have choked off access to the hydroelectric. So if that's where I, 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 I suspect that the dam is no longer producing hydroelectric en energy, but it didn't fail catastrophically. It was the water that was pushed over it rather than the dam that collapsed. So, not all landslides are as rapid and as catastrophic as this. So, there's a classification of different types of landslide, which is basically based on the speed at which the landslide moves. So, if we have very rapid velocities, uh, they usually involve some form of flow some form of turbulent flow, and so those are things like rock avalanches, debris flows, and debris avalanches. And they're also controlled by, and then at the slower speed, you rather have just gradual creep within the upper layers, or gradual slumps, which are more like what we saw at the beginning of the violent disaster. So that, those millimeter per day uh, pipe rates. You can also distinguish between events where the material remains intact. So if you have a slide, you have a strata which moves as a block. You can see that as this block is sliding down, the trees are remaining standing on it. It's not being broken up. So that's the difference between a slide and in places where it does disaggregate, and you end up with this jumble of blocks of what was initially what was originally intact, which we would refer to as roads or avalanches. Okay. So we'll go through a couple of different types of landslide. And the other thing that I wanted you to get from this is that you also have different terminology depending on what the material which is actually failing, which is actually moving. So if you have intact rock, you actually have material which is coming from in situ consolidated strata within something like the steep cliffs of Table Mountain. You would call that a rock slide if it stays intact, or a rock avalanche or fall if it breaks up. If it's material which was already unconsolidated, uh, so things like soil or uh, the tower slopes underneath the very steep intact rock, you would refer to them as earth or debris flows or creep. Okay? And the difference between earth flows and debris flows is in debris flows you have a wide range in grain size. So you have boulders as well as much more fine grain material, whereas with earth flows or mud flows, it's basically the same thing, you have much smaller particles, much more grains. So the example, the video that we saw at the beginning of the lecture was an example of the debris flow because you have those very large boulders at the front and then you also have that very brown, grey uh, water which is basically fine particles, basically mud, mixed with the water in the earth. So a rock fall, so rock, so it's coming from intact in situ strata. So again, we're thinking about something like the peninsular formation, the sandstones, and the steep slopes of Table Mountain. And if you have a rock fall, you are going to just have material which detaches, often on joints. So if you remember what joints were, those were the planes of weakness which are formed by opening, so not sliding, not shear, like we see in earthquakes, but small fractures which form by opening, which we get as the rock is exhumed towards the surface and the lithostatic stresses are reduced. And so these joints often cause failure, and that material can then fall. And generally speaking, this type of rock fall is the material doesn't go that far from the cliffs 
where it's coming from. So it would typically be something like 0.6 or 0.7 times the height that it falls is the distance that it will move horizontally. Okay? So these types of events are a problem if you live somewhere like Camps Bay, where you have lots of houses which are built really quite close to the very steep slopes and the mountains above. There are every so often a couple of occasions of a fairly large boulder coming down. Um, but they're unlikely to affect somebody who is living kilometers away. And that's not true for all types of landslide. So this is what the type of thing that we're looking at in terms of a photograph. So you basically have material which is just falling from these very steep slopes of intact cohesive rock. And that would be called a rock fall. Rock avalanches are typically where you have a much larger volume of material which fails from one of these steep slopes. And as that large volume falls, it breaks up, and you end up having this large volume of material which has got all types of grain sizes, so from very large boulders to very fine grain material. And this type of event can travel much further. Okay, so <coughs> the exact dynamics of how these rock avalanches travel as far as they do is something which is still very much debated in the literature. You'll find all kinds of often slightly bizarre theories so the one uh, suggestion is that it's kind of a hovercraft effect. So basically, the travel so far, because you trap a kind of cushion of air underneath this very large mass of rock, which enables it to move a relatively great distance away from the place where it originated. And that was suggested to explain how, in some cases, you have these rock avalanches actually flowing up over adjacent ridges and being deposited in the valley further over. But I don't think you need to worry too much about that because, as I say, it is something which is very much debated exactly why these rock avalanches form, that travel as far as they do. But these types of events are typically associated with an earthquake, actually. So these are secondary hazards. So the primary hazard would be the earthquake, and then the shaking can generate these very, very large quantities of material, which then falls. So this is an example from Alaska. So you can see this large rock avalanche, which is continuing off out of the photograph. And you can see there's one in the foreground, but there's actually another in the background as well. So there's been two separate, very large, failures which have basically filled this entire valley. Now this isn't a particularly populated area as you can see, because it's full of glaciers. Uh, but there have been examples of very populated areas affected by these kind of landslides where they've caused a huge amount of damage. So we're going to talk a little bit about where we have earthquakes and why we have them. Uh, but one area which has a lot of detonation, which has a lot of earthquakes, is this part of Asia and it's driven by India moving northwards towards Eurasia. And in this area, we have all these arrows. We'll talk a bit about more of them in the past. But basically, these arrows are showing areas where there's relatively large amounts of deformation. And around the northern part of India and the western part of China, there have both been a number of very large earthquakes in the last few years. And landslides have caused a serious amount of damage. So two events, the Sichuan earthquake, which happened over here in western China, and the Gurkha earthquake, which happened in Nepal over here. Both of these are areas with very steep topography, as you can see. So the Tibetan Plateau is an area which is very high. You go from very low level ground, very high level ground over a short distance. So obviously, for the secondary hazard of landslides to be important, you need to have steep slopes existing in the first place. If you have a flat area, you aren't going to have landslides after an earthquake. But in this particular area, we have very large slopes, very high slopes. We also, in this area, have a monsoonal climate. So you have periods where you have very heavy rainfall, and so the water table can be quite high. 
that can also weaken the slopes. And in both of these cases, there were a very large amount of landslides associated with the earthquake. So this, these maps here, are showing you the area which was affected by the shaking of the earthquake in Nepal and in Western China. And each of the black dots, and there were so many of them in this case, basically the whole area is covered by black dots, represent individual landslides. So this whole area, and this is one degree, so this is one kilometer, sorry, this is 100 kilometers. So you have probably a 60, 50 or 60 kilometer wide swathe of this area with high topography, where there were so many landslides, basically the whole area is covered by dots. So this whole area, anyone living in these steep valleys, which there are a lot of people, sort of agriculture in this area, again, because it's where the rain falls, would have been affected by these landslides. And often the landslides are much more devastating than the shaking of the earthquake itself, especially if people are living in relatively small buildings, relatively informal settlements, where building collapse is not such a problem. It doesn't tend to cause as much damage. Actually, it's the landslides which are causing a much greater problem. And you can see that there's a fairly large difference between the number of earthquakes in these two cases. And there are actually a number of different things which affect whether or not an earthquake is likely to trigger these very large numbers of landslides. So one thing is the depth of the earthquake. So as you move down below the surface, the surface shaking becomes much less, and so you're less likely to have landslides. So the Gorka earthquake was somewhat deeper than the Sichuan earthquake, so that might be one factor here. Uh, the slope distribution of the area that we've talked about before, both of these areas have lots of very steep slopes. The magnitude of the earthquake, obviously, both of these earthquakes were a similar magnitude. And in the paper which I've taken these from, they were actually arguing that the dip of the earthquake itself was actually playing an important role. So in this case, the fault that failed was barely shallowly dipping, whereas in this case, it was much deeper. So here about 5 to 10 degrees, here about 40 degrees. And the argument that they were making in that paper was that if you have a shallowly dipping plane versus a similar size but much steeper dipping plane that fails, the area immediately above the shallowly dipping plane is much greater. So you have the same amount of energy which is being produced by the earthquake, by the failure of the fault, but in the case of a steeper dipping plane, that energy is concentrated into a smaller spatial horizontal extent. And I was suggesting that that was perhaps why the Wenchuan earthquake in Sichuan, why that caused so many more landslides than the Gorka earthquake, even though the other factors in the two areas were quite similar. Yeah, so we mentioned before that I think I'm going to stop here because I don't think I'm going to get through the whole of the next example before quarter two. So I'd rather say, does anyone have any questions about the lecture?